In this lecture, I want to talk about one of the most important algorithms in computer science, and that's search. How do I find something in a list? We're going to look at two algorithms, one of which leverages structure on the data in the list. But before I do that, I want to point out a fact about arrays, which is that in an array, we can access any element of the array in constant time. This is different from a linked structure where we need to start at the beginning and sort of work our way toward the end. With an array, because the data is stored contiguously in memory, I can calculate the address of any given element and jump to it directly. I don't have to go through all the others to get there. Now, this is a class where you shouldn't believe things that I say without evidence. So I want to show you some supporting evidence for what I've said. We're going to look at the Java linked list class and the Java array list class. And as you expect, the array lists are implemented with arrays under the hood and linked lists are implemented with linked structures. I'm going to put 60 million elements in there and then we're going to start doing a performance test. We're going to start at about 256 in. And what I'm going to do is just go into the list I want to, for whichever one I'm looking at, a linked list or array list, all I'm going to do is index in and look at the nth element, where in is going to start off at 256 and go up to whatever I can get. And I just want to see how long it takes to do that. So we're going to do this repeatedly for increasing sizes and see what we get. This is the data I got when I ran this. It took a little while to start off because it had to create these 60 million elements for each of these two structures. But once it got going, it was pretty fast. And you can see here for the linked list, I eventually, you know, it starts off really fast, but eventually it starts taking some time. And so here you can see to access the last element of the linked list, it's going to take some time here. Um, it's in fact got the characteristic of a linear time algorithm. And that corresponds to the intuition of having to follow a linear number of links. With arrays instead, it doesn't matter how far you go, it never takes any time. This is the characteristic of a constant time function, which is that the time doesn't really increase as our data size increases. It's pretty much always the same. So with that background, let's look at the main problem of interest here, which is we're going to look to see if we can find an element in an array. And I'm going to assume some structure on the data in the array. In fact, I'm going to assume that the array is sorted. So let's just look at the kind of tests I expect. If I'm looking for 11 in this array, I'm going to find it. If I'm looking for 21, if I'm going to look for any of the elements that are there, then the result should be true. On the other hand, if I'm looking for something that's missing, like off by one for any of these elements, then I will not find it. Note that I'm allowing myself to assume here that the data is sorted. So we'll always have the smallest element in the beginning, the biggest element at the end, and order in between. So the question is, how can I go about and do this search? The first algorithm we're going to look at is called linear search. What do I do? Well, I'm going to start at the beginning. That's the low index of 0. And I'm going to go up to the high index of the list length minus 1. And what I'm going to do is say, while low is less than or equal to high, I'll look at the low indexed element. And if that's different from the one I'm looking for, that's the value I'm searching for, then I'll go ahead and increment the low. Otherwise, I can return. I can get out of here. If I get to the end of the list and I didn't find what I was looking for, well, in that case, I can simply return false. You didn't find it. So what are the values for low going to be here? Well, if I start looking at an array of size 512, then I expect the values of low to start at 0 and to go 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 511. So in general, for a list of length n, I expect there to be n different values of low. And therefore, I expect linear performance. And that's actually borne out experimentally. You can see it here. I'm getting the characteristic kind of function that I expect for linear time algorithms. 
One thing you'll note is that this algorithm doesn't make use of the fact that I have order on the data at all. We're just doing an exhaustive search here, starting at the beginning and going to the end. How could I use the fact that I actually have some structure on the data? Well, if you think about how you would do this with some cards, you'd just sort of jump in the middle and figure it out. Um, you know, metaphors with human behavior are sort of tricky with computers. A, a good way to think about this is, let's suppose there's a million file cabinets in a building and someone asks you to go find something. <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do? Well, a million file cabinets is a bother. You can't just eyeball that. So what you would ask is, well, is there any way I can find the thing? Like, what, is there any structure on this data? And let's say they tell you, well, they're sorted. They're sorted alphabetically. So now you have this person's name. You're going to go and try and find the filing cabinet. Where are you going to start? Are you just like, if, if you've got, you know, Abercrombie, you might start near beginning. If you've got uh, Miller, you might start somewhere in the middle. But in general, you're going to be wrong initially. You're going to get the wrong file cabinet, so you're going to have to reduce your search. The nice thing about using sorted data is that when I eliminate something, I don't just eliminate that thing, but I can eliminate that thing and everything to one side of it. So let's say I'm looking for Miller and I find Douglas. Well, then I know that from Douglas on down, I don't need to look. Miller is going to be above that. This ability to split the data in half, if you like, or in two parts when it's sorted, is what's called binary search. And the binary here just has to do with the fact that there's two different parts, the part above, the part below. And we can use that to make the search more efficient. So here's the algorithm. Let's just watch it run. And you can see, as I double the size of the input here, I'm not seeing any appreciable change to the time that the search takes. We are noticing a delay. And if you look at the test here, what we're doing is creating an array of a certain size. And that takes some time. So if I create an array of 6 million elements, it's going to take linear time. And that's why you're noticing this slowdown in the output. But my test is not measuring the time to create the array, only to actually run the contains method. So we create our stopwatch after the array is generated. We run contains, and then we immediately stop the stopwatch. And that's why it's taking a longer time here, but we're not seeing that reflected in the numbers, because that linear time is in array generation, not in the contains method itself. So binary search, this algorithm, is blindingly fast. Let's just think about how it works, and then we can come back and look at the code. To show you how binary search works, I'm going to use a demo from the textbook. Here we have an array of 15 elements indexed from 0 to 14. We're going to look for element 33 in this array. Now, if you are looking for 33 in this array, you might start over toward the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Binary search is always going to start right in the middle. So we compute the midpoint by subtracting the high from the low and adding the low. And in this case, we get 7. The number we find there is 53. And 53 is larger than our goal, 33. Now, because this list is sorted, we know not only that 53 is not what we're looking for, but we also know that none of these positions from 7 up to the end of the array could possibly hold the value we're looking for, because they all must be greater than or equal to 53, and therefore greater than or equal to 33. Therefore, in one fail swoop, we can reduce the search in half. We do this by updating the high variable to be 1 minus the previous mid. We've removed the midpoint and everything above it. Now we compute the midpoint again between the new low and high. 
And again, it's simply going to be the high minus the low divided by two plus the low, which in this case is three. Now three holds the value 25, which is less than our goal of 33. Therefore, we know that this index and everything beneath it cannot possibly hold our value. What we're going to do, therefore, is update the low pointer to 1 plus the mid. So we'll move our low pointer here. Again, we've cut the problem in half. We now have three elements left. So to compute the midpoint, we take the high minus the low divided by 2 and then add the low. And in this case, that's going to give us 5, which holds the number 43. 43 is larger than 33. Therefore, we are going to move the high pointer down so that it is now equal to the low pointer. Now our low point and our high point are equal, and therefore so is our midpoint. Fortunately for us, in this case, we found what we're looking for, and therefore we can return success. We found the location of this element to be 4. Let's suppose we're not so lucky and we're looking for something that we're actually not going to find. Well, the process is going to go just as before until we get to the very end. So we'll keep knocking the problem in half just as we did before. But now, when we get to the last element, we see that we're not finding what we're looking for. What did we find? We found 33, which is less than 34. And therefore, I know that 33 and everything below it could not possibly be helpful. Um, what was I doing before? Well, I just raised low in this point, so I'd move low up by 1. But now note that low and high have crossed over, and therefore there's no elements remaining to look at. I can simply say, it's not here. And if I'm looking for the position of the ray, I'll simply return negative 1. When I write that as code, it looks like this. I start at my low index of 0, my high index of the list length minus 1. While low is less than or equal to high, I'm simply going to compute the new midpoint. Then, looking at the value and comparing it to the midpoint, or the, the value at the midpoint, I'm going to see, is it uh, greater, less, or equal? If the value is greater than the midpoint, then I update low. If the value is less than the midpoint, I update high. And finally, if it's neither of those things, it must be equal, and therefore I can simply return true. If I get to the end of this and I didn't see what I was looking for, then I know it's not there. It's fun to actually watch this run on some data and print out the values. So let's instrument the code to do some printing. And let's run it on some random data and see what we get. I ran this 100 times on random data, and 57 times I found what I was looking for. Let's do it again. 45. Again, 53. Again, 44. Again, 60. Sometimes I get lucky, sometimes I don't. So the test that I'm running here is written at the bottom. It's a print test. And I'm generating an array of in numbers. These are actually going to be the numbers shown at the top here, um, going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What I'm going to do is then pick a random number between 0 and the bound. And then with 50% probability, I'm going to perturb it by a little bit so that I'm missing a value. So I should have about 50% chance of finding what I'm looking for. And then I'm just going to look for it, and if I found it, I've got it. I've instrumented the code to print the values of low and high along the way. So here, we're going to show low and high at each iteration of the loop, and then once we fall out. It's interesting to look at the kind of patterns you get. Sometimes we find some things toward the beginning, sometimes they're toward the end. I've written some of these out in the slides, and you can see here, this is a search toward the end of what I'm looking for. Here's a search toward the beginning. And these are successful in that they stop before high and low cross, whereas there's some here that are unsuccessful where 
low has actually become larger than high. That means I'm not finding what I'm looking for. It can be difficult to see the pattern that code here. What do all these have in common? Because you can see that they move in very different ways depending upon exactly which part of the array I'm narrowing into. Another thing I can do is to print out the difference between the high and the low value. This is telling me how many elements remain in consideration as I search through the array. And in this case, you can see that it's always the same. If I start with 1,023 elements, after comparing one element, I've cut the problem in half to 511. After looking at the second element, I've cut it in half again to 255, and so on and so forth. If the search fails, I'll end up with zero elements at the end. If the search succeeds, then I'll stop before I get to zero elements. Why is binary search so fast? It's because each time I look at an element, I cut the problem in half. So if I look at one midpoint, I've now reduced my search space by 50%. And that means that the number of midpoints I'll compute here is the logarithm of the size of the input. If I start with about 1,000 elements, then I've only got about 10 that I need to look at in order to determine whether or not the element that I'm curious about is there. It's interesting to compare the code for binary search and linear search. You can see that in linear search, I'm only ever updating my low pointer. And when I move my low pointer, I'm moving it always by one. So you can see the values that low will take here will go from zero up to the list length minus one in the case that I don't find what I'm looking for. In binary search, I update either low or high. And when I update that variable, I'm updating it by half the difference between high and low. And therefore, I'm cutting the problem in half each time. So if you think about the number of elements I have left to look at, in the case of binary search, this is a geometric series, constantly cutting the number in half. In the case of linear search, this is an arithmetic series, always reducing the problem by one. Note that the body of the loop is doing at most a constant amount of work here. And therefore, what we care about is just how many times this loop body executes. In this case, for linear search, we will execute the loop body a linear number of times. And for binary search, we will execute the loop body a logarithmic number of times. And that's why we see linear time performance for linear search and logarithmic performance for binary search.